So our objectives today is just to understand um, after midlife, what, how our sleep patterns change. What changes in us to cause our sleep to change as we get older? It does change. Uh, what are non-medical factors that affect sleep in a, in a bad way, negatively? And then tips for improving sleep quality. So first, a little background. Obviously, I think to all of us, we need sleep because our brains work better when they've had enough sleep. If you've been um, sleep deprived for a period of time, if you've been jet lagged, you may find your brain isn't working as well, a little slower to come up with information, may even feel confused if you're very sleep deprived. Also tied though to that is physical performance. Our reaction time slows down if we're sleep deprived, for example, we may stumble more, but it affects our physical performance. And not surprisingly, it affects our mental and physical health. Very strong connection between sleep problems and depression and anxiety. If you're depressed and anxious, you often can't sleep well or you sleep too much. Or if you aren't sleeping well, for whatever reason, it's not uncommon to become sad, depressed, or anxious. So very strong connection there. So this slide actually cracks me up, quite frankly. That's why I put the uh, smiley face on there. So in 2008, and they still say the same thing, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine said, these populations are at risk for sleep deprivation. Males and females of all ages. <laughs> so that cracks me up a little bit. Well, there, let's just narrow it down a little bit, shall we? <laughs> so other populations who are at risk, though, adolescents and teens. That's pretty expected, right? They're, especially today, overscheduled. They're in a lot of activities. They want to stay up late and, and text or be online. Um, and they need a lot more sleep at that age when they're, they're still growing and developing. Sleep disorders, obviously, affect the quality and the, the content of our sleep. Uh, medical conditions, certain medical conditions affect our sleep. One that's very near and dear to probably some of you here in this room is Alzheimer's disease um, and other dementias too. Uh, so if you have a loved one um, with a dementia or you're uh, dealing with that yourself, you've probably noticed some, some changes in sleep, um, particularly with those with Alzheimer's, maybe thinking it's time to get up at 2.30 or 3, not sleeping through the whole night. Parkinson's disease is similar. Uh, people who perform shift work, makes sense. Um, often the, the world operates in a, in a daytime schedule. So if someone works at night um, and they're sleeping in the day, there's a lot of light out, there's a lot more noise out, and they tend to not sleep as well. If people are working multiple jobs or have just really long hours, and then not surprisingly, caregivers. This can be caregivers to children. It can be caregivers to someone who's 30 but had surgery, and it could be caregivers of those with dementia. Uh, particularly, we, we see those folks having um, sleep problems and not good quality sleep. So all of these kinds of uh, causes of sleep deprivation, we do categorize. So you have your voluntary behavior. If I decide that I'm going to binge watch a show on Netflix on my iPad till two in the morning, which I have done. Get into watching, you can watch all the episodes of something back to back, and you're like, I'm just gonna watch one more. And I did that with the show Breaking Bad, if any of you watched that. That is not a lighthearted show that you watch at midnight and then sleep soundly after. <laughs> that was voluntary behavior, I did that to myself. I chose to do that to myself. Personal obligations we covered on the previous slide. I have to work, I have to care for someone, my child is sick, my, my mother who has Alzheimer's disease is up in the middle of the night and needs care. Work hours we covered and then medical problems. We'll talk a little more about those. So how do we know how much sleep we need as individuals? Any of you ever heard that we need less sleep as we get older? It's actually a myth. We, we, we're still adults who need a good amount of sleep. But how do we determine individual sleep needs? So um, basal sleep need is the amount of sleep I need, my body needs to function well. I function pretty well on less sleep than is recommended. Doesn't mean that it's best for me, but I can function well that way. Some people cannot function without 
a good eight hours of sleep. I, I work with people like that. If they don't get seven or eight hours, they, are, they say they're worthless in the day. So their basal sleep need is different than mine and maybe different than yours. Sleep debt is the amount of sleep we lose. Um, so in other words, it's a deficit and our body feels it's owed that sleep. Um, so and it's things because of noise, illness, just not scheduling enough. So the interaction of these two things is what we look at for individual sleep needs. Um, how much do I need and, and, and how long have I gone with this debt of sleep? So how much do we really need? Adults still need, no matter what age, seven to nine hours. Maybe I function okay on seven, maybe you're nine. It's usually a range, but that's what our body needs to really regenerate at night. Um, and actually memories are really well stored so that we can retrieve them by sleep at night. That's, uh, our, our memory gets fuzzier because of that. So the teens, we talked about sleep debt among adolescents and teens. As you can see, uh, they need eight and a half to 9.25 hours. So they need more at that age. So it's a myth. We, we may function on less sleep, but we, we need just as much sleep as we ever did as a younger adult. But what happens with age is we have a decrease in the maximal capacity for sleep. We're not able to sleep as well as long. Kind of a bummer that we still need seven to nine hours, but it's hard for us to sleep soundly for seven to nine hours. We'll talk about that. So that ability to sleep well for most of us changes. Anybody know why? So here's some of the, those reasons. So our circadian rhythm is increasingly variable as we get older. And that's the, you've probably heard of that before, it's our 24 hour clock that our body resets itself basically, it runs on a 24 hour cycle. Uh, why do you think that would be, that we, our bodies would run on a 24 hour cycle? It's the cycle of a day, 24 hour day. Sun comes up, sun goes down. Um, so our bodies um, work that way. So it's our biological clock basically. And light is the strongest synchronizer of that. So we need to be exposed to light for our body to recognize um, and function well in regards to sleep. If you think about um, Alaska, the times of year where, and then there are some other countries actually too, where it's, it's dark for most of the day or light for most of the day, that, that they have a lot of issues with sleep patterns and Ill related illnesses in those, those areas. So, um, and we tolerate jet lag le less well when we're older. So if we're 20 and we take a big European trip and we're jet lagged when we get back, we recover more quickly than we do when we're older. Has anyone noticed that? I'm seeing some nodding heads. It's the circadian rhythm. It's, it's very more variable as we get older. So we actually do have a decrease in total sleep time. Um, which I mentioned. So basically that's a sleep efficiency change. So say you get in bed at 11 in the evening and you're in bed until eight, but you're only actually asleep six of those hours. So your sleep efficiency has something to be desired there. If you were hoping to get in bed at 11, fall asleep at 11.05 and wake up at eight, your sleep efficiency is, is affected. So it's the ratio of the total time you're in bed um, to the amount of time that you're actually sleeping. Um, we wake up more after we fall asleep when we're older, and that kind of increases from middle age on and it levels out at some point differently for different people. Um, we have a decrease in our slow wave sleep. Now most of us hear about REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep, and think that that's the best, really, um, most um, rejuvenating sleep, but it's the slow wave sleep or the non-REM sleep that is our deepest sleep and our most um, regenerating sleep. So it, during that time, we don't have that eye movement. Then has everyone seen someone sleeping either with having the rapid eye movement or you've seen it on TV and the, the eyes are moving around a lot under the, the eyelids? In this sleep, we are out. We are calm, we're not agitated, nothing's, nothing's going on. Um, in REM sleep, our muscles are actually paralyzed. While, while, now, the minute we wake up, 
they're not paralyzed anymore. And usually in this um, slow wave sleep, we're not dreaming. So our minds aren't even active. They're that relaxed and that sleepy. So things that affect these concepts more in later years. First of all, we tend to take more medications when we're older. And maybe um, a side effect is listed that it may make you sleepy or it may make you um, anxious and not be able to sleep. But a lot of times that's not listed and it still is the way that it affects you. Um, the other thing is the interactions of the medications we're on can sometimes cause side effects. Maybe we are on a diuretic and we have to get up and go to the bathroom more. Maybe we're taking something that upsets our stomach. So those things also have to do with medication sometimes. We talked about the anxiety and depression that affects our sleep. Um, some, some people with a depression will just want to sleep all the time, but a majority of people who are depressed and it's not treated well are more likely to have insomnia or to wake up anxious a lot in the night. Other health problems, these are just things we tend to get more when we're older, the, the gastroesophageal reflux disease, so people who have kind of that heartburn when they lie down. Uh, chronic pain um, makes sense. And a lot of us have some variation of that. Something hurts. Um, so we, we have to kind of wake up and move. Heart disease, Alzheimer's disease. So all of these sorts of things. So in the lab, now they're looking at, um, I think this particular study was with rats. So in the lab setting, might have been mice. They actually purposefully sleep deprived, the critters. We'll call them critters. And studied them, and they found that when they were sleep deprived, their blood sugar wasn't as well controlled. So we all need to have our blood sugar well controlled. For diabetics, that's particularly concerning. Um, they had an increased appetite. We have something called leptin that, that stimulates our appetite. Um, and they, they had less leptin, which means they were hungrier and thought they wanted to eat more. Uh, so then they ended up gaining weight um, because of sleep deprivation. You wouldn't think that, would you? But you're sleep deprived, your body um, has a, a decrease in this leptin, therefore I'm hungry and I want to eat more, all because I'm tired. Increased cortisol, that's a stress hormone. Uh, blood pressure went up. The sympathetic nervous system was overly activated and they had um, increased markers of inflammation. So. Uh, inflammation, we associate obviously with arthritis and things like that, but it's being more strongly associated with dementias too, um, more, more research related to the effect of inflammation. So other studies, now these were various studies of humans, um, same thing, high blood pressure. Humans who were sleep deprived had higher blood pressure than what, those who had good sleep. They had more heart problems which came first, the heart problems or the sleep loss, I'm not sure. Um, adults, humans who are uh, reporting chronic poor sleep are heavier. Harder time managing the weight, probably because of the slide we saw before in the leptin. More likely to be diabetic, more likely to be depressed, we talked about that, but besides that, they're also more likely to abuse um, substances, particularly alcohol, to, to, to cope with not sleeping. And a lot of times people will have a drink or two or three thinking it will help them sleep better, and it does very temporarily, but then the way the body um, um, synthesizes or processes that alcohol is it actually causes you to wake up, um, more likely to wake up in the middle of the night. And it changes our ability to hold attention, uh, our reaction time, which can particularly be an issue for sleepy drivers, we found. And we're less able to remember new information, it doesn't store. So uh, other effects, excessive daytime sleepiness. I think we've all experienced that. We're trying to stay awake, yawning. Um, so we're more likely to uh, fall asleep when we're sitting still or listening. Uh, and again, it can be a hazard when we're driving. So other effects, and we've all experienced this, whether ourselves or we've noticed it in others, we become more irritable if we're sleep deprived. We're, we're less motivated to get things done. We're less productive often when we're sleep deprived. Anx anxiety and depression again. And again, which came first? And then these other things we'll see. 
I think part of uh, these we covered, what we didn't cover um, uh, real well is lack of coordination. I mentioned early on we're more likely to trip, drop things, uh, which unfortunately leads sometimes to more injuries and people will report, I was just, I didn't sleep well last night, I'm not sure how I fell. And, and there, we hear this over and over again, that someone was just groggy. Uh, distractibility is also an issue. So now I'm gonna give you some tips though. What can you do to improve your sleep? So exercise, we think about it affects our muscles, we think about how it affects our, our heart and our weight and our diabetes and our blood pressure, but we don't think about the direct correlation usually between, I exercised half an hour today, I'm probably gonna sleep better tonight. So um, particularly aerobic, um, but that doesn't mean high impact major uh, uh, aerobics classes that are, that are so difficult to keep up with that you um, can't do them. Um, it could, could be um, biking or even a stationary bike. So it improves that slow wave sleep. That sleep we talked about, that you really are in a deep sleep, is improved by exercise. So in 13, there was a, a sleep uh, in America did a poll, and they said that um, in the, all the people they studied, this ended up continuing today from this previous study to be the case, that those who exercise slept better. The other thing that you can do, may be a little harder here in Ohio in the winter, <laughs> It's getting some exposure to light, sunlight. Now we know that if we want 15 minutes of that exposure a day anyway, right, for our bones, so our vitamin D in our bones will be stronger. Uh, but studies over the year have, have a, linked this exposure in the day to light to better sleep. So one place we see this as a problem is people who live in a, a long-term care facility and maybe they're, they get up in the morning and they're up all day, but they're in artificial light inside a building. They don't really get exposed to natural sunlight or, or are even by bright windows or things. So when they are placed, taken outside every day or somehow um, placed in more bright light that's not as artificial, they um, will sleep better usually. Now it depends on your other medical conditions, but that's a strong association with better sleep. So um, at night though, of course, we sleep better without lights on. Now one of the challenges with that is, we always like to tell people of any age, but particularly when we get older, because our eyes don't adjust to the dark as well. So a lot of times we'll suggest to people um, have a, a, a kind of an ambient light far away, but there are um, uh, night lights that are actually motion sensitive. So you can plug them in, step out of bed, the night light will come on and then it will go back off. So that's what we suggest for people who are having that issue. Other things to improve the quality of our sleep. So these are the things we wanna to do to have better sleep. This is hard to do, at least it is for me. If you really want your body to get acclimated, go to sleep at the same time. Go to bed at the same time every day. And the thing about that is, the, the studies will show you need to do that Saturday and Sunday and Friday too. A lot of us do that. We'll go to bed at the same time during the week, particularly when we're working, but we tend to maybe stay up much later on the weekend and then we sleep much later on the weekend and then our body doesn't want to get back in that rhythm. Same thing with getting up. Again, you're putting your, your body on the same kind of 24 hour clock, right? Where it, it recognizes it's, it's time. It's, it's the time to get up, it's time to go to bed. So the regular exercise we talked about, uh, the bright lights we talked about. So other things to do. So the room, um, actually, temperature that's associated with best sleep is actually a slightly cool room. Now, people sometimes are surprised by that. They think if it's, real, if it's warm, then I'll be cozier. But a slightly cool room is what's been associated in, in the literature with a little better sleep. Uh, but you have to keep your hands and your feet warm. If your feet are cold or your hands are cold, you tend to not sleep as well. Um, part of the thought about that is if it's slightly cool, you cuddle in, you, 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 you kind of like a critter again, you cuddle, you get a little more cozy. So relaxation exercises are suggested for folks who have a hard time sleeping. You can actually Google relaxation exercises and find so many options that you can pick one that works for you. 
Um, some people, um, I know historically we've always heard people doing the warm milk, um, but taking a bath, having a massage, I'd be sure, that'd be nice. Yeah, I'd like to have a massage every night right before I get in bed, but maybe you can trade off with someone. Um, or whatever's soothing to you. So here's one that's not popular. Here's the one that I don't follow the rules on. Your beds are really only for sleep and sex. We're not supposed to have TVs on or our iPads on or reading. I've read in bed from the time I was two under the flashlight, getting in trouble for having my books and flashlight out. And it's, it, that's what I'm, I'm bad at. I want to read before I go to bed. I tend now to do it on my iPad. You've got that light. It's that artificial light staring you in the face. Um, sleep study folks are now studying the effect of that on sleep and it's not helping us to have our devices on. They say put them away an hour before bed now. They said don't be looking at that light or overstimulating. So the suggestion and the studies for the best sleep show sleep and, and, and sex is what the bed is for. So they say if you can't sleep though, try, try to get to sleep or try to get back to sleep. But after 15 or 20 minutes, don't just lie there and toss and turn for another hour or two. The, all the sleep neurologists and sleep medicine folks will say, get up, sit in the chair and read. We'll go out to the kitchen and, and, and get a drink and focus on some, fold a, fold a basket of laundry. They, they say, do something else for a few minutes and then go back because if you lie awake and, and, and you're lying awake and trying to sleep in bed, your body's associating bed with being awake and it needs to associate it with being asleep. Um, and they, it's just, it's actually sleep training. So the sleep docs will do this with people. They'll train them bed for sleep or sex. If you're not sleeping and you're not having sex, after a period of time, you get out of bed. Medications, take what you're taking as directed, but make sure that you discuss with your doctor if you need. I'm not sleeping well all of a sudden. Could it be the fact that we added another medication to my regime? Is there something else we can look at? Um, and discuss the use of sleeping pills. So um, sleeping pills, if, if someone takes Tylenol PM every night, takes two of those every night, and that's just an example, any sleep aid, um, it actually becomes ineffective at some point your body becomes used to it. So you might find that it's not working very well anymore. Um, so the other thing is, is that as we get older, our bodies metabolize and respond to these sleep aids differently. And we're uh, much more likely to be not only groggier with them, but also less well-coordinated. So you take two sleep aids, you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, we're likely to fall. We have a lot of people coming through our emergency departments in the U.S. who fall in at night anyway, and, and it's not uncommon that when we ask, you know, what they might have taken or, you know, all those sorts of questions you ask, that they had sleep aid. Um, and some people report having a sleep, kind of a hangover the next day when they take sleep aid. So they would be something to discuss with your physician if to use them, and if so, which one? There are prescription ones, there are over-the-counter ones, and maybe it would be something to use occasionally and not often, but be, but be very careful when you're taking them the older you get. Uh, so don't exercise vigorously right before bed. As I mentioned, few people might be able to. Don't engage in those stimulating activities, the iPad, binge-watching a show, um, arguing in bed, watching television, something like that. Uh, and then the suggestions still are not to have caffeine uh, past the afternoon if you're having trouble sleeping. It is a, still a stimulant, still might keep you awake. There's caffeine hidden in things. Remember, chocolate has some caffeine, so look for the hidden caffeine. I actually had to tease my mother-in-law because she, um, she said she didn't like the caffeine-free diet Dr. Pepper because it tastes different than the regular Dr. Pepper. And, and we had to convince her caffeine doesn't have a flavor. <laughs> There's no flavor to it. It shouldn't taste any different. It's just the stimulant effect is what's different. So don't use alcohol to help you sleep. It, indeed, you might take a couple drinks and feel sleepy. I, I bet many of us have either experienced or seen someone have a beer and start getting sleepy, right? Because basically alcohol is sugar. 
So it's going to make us up and then we're going to crash from it. But the way it's, it's processed through the liver, it actually then becomes a stimulant, basically. It doesn't help us sleep later. So eating in bedtime, you're not supposed to go to bed starving. So if you're a little bit hungry, you're probably pretty likely, if you wake up in the middle of the night, to be really hungry. And actually being hungry keeps you from sleeping well in most cases. So you, it's better to have a light snack of some sort when you go to bed. Um, a piece of cheese, something like that with protein is actually good for your blood sugar versus something that's, that's a high in carbohydrate. So if we eat a slice of bread, it turns into sugar. If we eat a piece of cheese, it's, it's less um, so. But you're also not supposed to go to bed too full. It, it actually causes the body to uh, be less restful. So it's something in between. Obviously, we don't want to um, take someone else's sleeping pills. I've seen this happen. I've seen someone say, I've tried Ambien. Ambien's working really well for me. Why don't you try some? And the problem is, is that person might have a medical condition or take something else that they've had an issue with, particularly so when we get older, metabolizing things differently. And they've ended up at the doctor and the emergency department, and we've had to um, help um, fix some issue. Uh, and then always talk with the doctor about sleeping pills. So naps, people ask, are naps okay? The typical recommendation is don't, unless you are sick. Now, some sleep docs will say, if you wanna take one 20 minute nap, a little cat nap, that's actually okay. It's the two hours of napping, or the people who take five 20 minute naps in the day, and then say, I'm not sleeping well at night. Well. If you're not sleeping well at night, you probably are more inclined to want to nap in the day, right? But if you can keep yourself awake, in theory, so that you can sleep better at night, that's a good thing. Now, exceptions, if you have a sleep disorder, an actual disease, or something like that, um, we have to treat the underlying symptoms of the disease, the, say the sleep apnea or the, the restless legs. The handheld devices, we mentioned that already, more and more we're showing that disrupts. And so um, we do have increased challenges sleeping well, but treatment for the medical conditions can help. And I, um, again, I don't um, go into those in depth because we would want to have one of our sleep docs talk about that. But, but um, I'm sure that you've heard of sleep apnea. And we see that a lot in our system where people um, are, first of all, usually snoring a lot. It's one sign of sleep apnea, someone who snores a lot, and they actually are stopping breathing for some period of time at night. It could be a few seconds, once or twice a night. It could be 20, 30 times a night for longer seconds. Um, and a lot of times those people, when they have sleep apnea and, and that happens, they're the people sometimes that go <laughs> They snort themselves away. That'll look really good on film, Carlos. <laughs> they snort and they wake themselves up. Now, not that we can't do that without sleep apnea, but it's a hallmark of those people with that. They tend to have weight here. When we're sleeping, the weight is pressing up on our diaphragm, pre pressing up on our lungs. We're not sleeping as well. And, it's a, it, it, and it can be a potentially de deadly condition for people who have a serious case of it, who are, are continue to um, stop breathing for periods of night and they're doing it for longer and longer. That's not good, obviously, for your brain, not good for your health. And um, so they will assess people, usually in a lab, they usually have to sleep in the lab overnight and uh, find out if that's what they have. They do a lot of lab studies. Uh, all the systems here in Columbus, not just Ohio Health, I think, do sleep medicine. So if you feel like what you're experiencing isn't related to some of the things we've talked about, I'm stressed, I'm watching my iPad late at night, those kinds of things, but you feel it's related to a disease, I encourage you to talk to your primary care and have them refer you to a sleep specialist because um, sleep is very important and we, we, we write it off too often as, well, everyone's sleep deprived, but we shouldn't be. So we can sleep better again if we can only follow those rules. I wish you good sleep. Thank you.